right, the two natures, righteousness by faith, part one. And I'm going to quickly kneel for an added word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as you know, I can do nothing of my own. Please, Lord, cleanse me, purify me, fill me with your sweet Holy Spirit of truth, that everything that is said and done here is to your glory, and uh, that you receive all the praise and worship. Because I ask and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Send your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Righteousness by faith, the two natures, part one. I don't know how many parts there's going to be to this study. Uh, we'll just have to see. But um, I, I, I was asked to speak on this. And I'll be honest with you, I've, I've spoken... Um, Around it, I suppose, I've mentioned the topic, I've talked about it here and there in different messages, but I've never actually put a focus on it. So this is the first time presenting this particular message. And out of all the people that I could think of that um, would probably be the best resource um, for study material on this, I thought of Pastor Dennis Preby. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. He's with Amazing Facts, and that's what he does. He travels all over the country, and he preaches righteousness by faith. That is, that is his pretty much all he preaches on. I don't know that he preaches on a whole lot other than that. Um, so he's been doing that for I don't know how many years. And um, so I, I listened to him, and I've... And I've um, taken uh, notes from him and others as well, and done my own studies as well. So um, the only thing that is kind of sad, I, I, met, I had the privilege of meeting Dennis Preeby not, Preeby not too long ago. He's a very sweet, genuine-hearted, loving man. Um, but he has chosen to be very particular about where he presents his messages, and he will not present a message in anything other than a sanctioned Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, he refuses to preach any, as far as I know, he hasn't changed that. I think that's a mistake. I think, um, you know, we've seen from David Gates, Pastor David Gates, he had the same requirements as well years ago, but he's had to forego that. And, um, you know, I feel like, you know, if we look at Christ's example, what did Christ, who did Christ reach out to? Did he stick only with the, the church of his day? No. no. Who, did, who did he really preach to? The ones that were cast out for the most part and looked down upon. So I think that may be a, a mistake on uh, Pastor Preeby's, Preeby's uh, part, but um, anyway, I'm sure that um, he will figure that out at some point. And, um, because this message is really not a popular message within Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, he has repeatedly refused uh, the access to many different churches and has even canceled many times because of this message. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a popular message, but it's of very, very great importance. And you'll see that, I think, hopefully, as we go along. I'm going to start with our opening uh, scripture that, we, that uh, Brother Charlie read for us. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There's a lot of sermon in that, in those two passages right there of Scripture. Um, very, very powerful message and uh, one to be taken to heart. If we're going along the broad road along with the rest of the masses, we're probably not in on the right path. Amen? Probably need to examine that. Okay, well, we're going to be looking at these two natures. The first one I'm going to call the, uh, the nature is in predestination, the predestination gospel, okay? In... Uh, in, in this one, we're going to see, this is the first example of human nature that we're going to be looking at. And, um, you know, you could also refer to this as a once saved, always saved gospel. 
That's really ultimately what it is. It's a once saved, always saved gospel. The very first point that we want to look at here is sin as our nature. That's what this gospel teaches, is that we are naturally born sinners. After the fall of Adam and Eve, once they partook, partook of that fruit, and uh, Jesus came down and said, what have you done? And he had to make them skins of, uh, out of clothing out of skins. And he had to force them out of the garden in case they continued to eat from the tree of life and live forever in their sins. So from that point forward, um, the belief is that we have a fallen sinful nature. And this gospel teaches that if you, all you have to do is to be born and take that first breath and you are sinning. You're a helpless, hopeless sinner. And unless you are born again, you have no chance of salvation. Which, that part is, we're good with that, right? So in other words, we're all born with a bad nature. This is a quote that I found on DesiringGod.org. Unrighteousness is often spoken of in Scripture as something belonging to the human race as a whole. This implies that it is the property of our species... In other words, sinfulness is considered a property of human nature after the fall, you see. Thus, it must be concluded that we are all born sinners, since we are all born human, and sin is regarded as a property of humanity. That's on a, a Protestant, or a, um, I should say, evangelical uh, website there, and that's what they believe, that is what is being taught. This is a very popular, I should say, rephrase that, this is the most popular gospel, by the way. Now, how do they substantiate this from Scripture? They support it with this text here, Psalms 51 and verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. What does that mean? What does it mean, shapen in iniquity? In the mother's womb, right? God formed each one of us in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. So that's how they support this belief, that one of these, one of the texts. There's other texts, but that's the primary one that I've seen them use to support this gospel. So should we support or should we create a theology around one or two scriptures? Or should we look at the whole of Scripture? We should look at the 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 whole of Scripture, not just a few Scriptures possibly taken out of context. Well, what about Christ? Well, if this is truth, that we are all born sinners, then there's no way that Christ was born with our nature. Christ obviously had to have been born with an advantage. He had to have been born with the nature of Adam before the fall. And this is what they teach. They teach that he has, literally has an unfair advantage over us. Because if he had been born with our nature, he would have been born as a sinner, and therefore he would not be our perfect sacrifice and could not be our Savior. Right? The next point is justification alone. Justification alone Sorry, folks. Same. This has never happened. Same. Yeah. yeah. He don't want us to hear. Right. That's right. Hmm. It's not lighting up. Hmm. 
there it is. Oh, Frisco. Hallelujah. Kind of. What is this? I think it is. Looks like it's coming up. It's coming. Go ahead and turn these lights off. Up the screen a little bit. Okay, justification alone. In other words, justification is the only thing that God grants us. Ultimately, it's 100% God. Okay? Justification. And justification is really what? It's just a big word for forgiveness. That's what justification is. We have repentant hearts. We go down on our knees. We uh, plead for forgiveness from God. He grants it to us. And ultimately, if you choose Him as your Savior, then you would be baptized, etc. Okay? So justification is 100% Christ alone. Let's look at this. Uh, believers in this gospel and what they say. It says justification is 100% Christ's work, but sanctification is work done by us, aided by the indwelling of Christ. So it's a 50-50. Does that sound right? Is there anything that I can do to save myself? You know, sanctification, it, when, we, when, when we're justified, we're forgiven of our sins. Sanctification is when we continue on and we remain forgiven and we don't commit any other sin. Okay? But in this particular uh, gospel here, it says that sanctification is work done by us, aided by the indwelling of Christ. Hmm. That's interesting. There's really nothing that we can do to save ourselves. We can look up here. Let's, let's look at Malachi. Let's just take this in, as an example. Um, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. In this particular gospel, it says that this is okay. It's okay if you have a bad month, let's say, and you are... Or maybe a bad year even. You know, the, the economy has really hit you hard. You've lost your job. Uh, you're just uh, working odd jobs here and there. You're trying to provide for your family. So you choose to withhold your tithes and your offerings. And you say, well, God understands. Okay? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, discredit me for this. It's, it's okay. He understands. Well, is that truth? Is that right? We read here in Malachi 3 and verses 8 and 9 and 10, Will a man rob God, yet have ye robbed me? But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. And then we'll just skip on down to verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, where herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the, the windows of heaven and pour out Pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Amen. So what is it if we, if we uh, hold back our tithes and offerings? What is that? It's robbery. It's robbery to God. We are not supposed to do that. And to me that sounds like, how can you continue to be saved if you're robbing God? How can that be okay and acceptable, uh, even if we have the very best excuse. And why would we want to do that anyway? Because, she, because God says, test me in this, prove me in this. See if I won't pour out the, open up the windows of heaven and pour out your uh, blessings upon you. Yes, Cheryl. It seems like from this verse, it sounds like if you're robbing God, you're actually robbing yourself of the blessings that you can have. Amen. You're, you're, not, you're not exercising your faith. Okay, the next point, Perfection. Can we have perfection with this gospel? Perfection's impossible. That's a, that's a dirty word. You know, back with that. No, no, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't believe that we can have perfection if we believe in this gospel. It's impossible. Because our nature is sinful in nature. We are just sinful, period. There's, there's, there's no way that we can obtain perfection. So in other words, if 
we are in this belief of the gospel. If this is really truth, we go down to the end of time, that we're the last day people as we believe that we are, then we're going to be sinning right up until Jesus comes. And somehow, miraculously, he's going to press a button in our brain and all of a sudden we're going to be pure. And we're going to be perfect. What happens when the probation is closed and Jesus stands up and says, it's finished. Let him that is unjust be unjust. Where is your protection at that point? I don't know. I'm not so sure about this gospel. Now this gospel is the common and popular gospel and it has been for over 17 centuries. Over 17 centuries, this has been the most popular and most common doctrine. Um, just because something is popular, does that necessarily mean it means that it's right? You know, there's a story of a man a long time ago, and he, he built this boat, and there had never been rain before this time, but he stepped out in faith and he built this boat, and he preached for some 120 years. Was his preaching popular? No, because there was only eight people that ended up coming onto that boat. Was he the minority or the majority at that point? The minority, right? Now fast forward a few months, then what was he? He was the majority, right? And they stepped off that ark, they were the majority because God had done away with all the rest. So just because something is popular does not necessarily mean it's right. Well, what is the fruit of this particular gospel? Let's look at what the fruit of this particular gospel is, and let's see how, from Scripture, we need to discern this fruit. What is Matthew 7? Going back to Matthew 7 again. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. Are you going to be able to, to, to easily detect these folks? No, they look like sheep. But inwardly, inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Hmm. Be careful. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or, or of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. It's very important by their fruits. We need to, we're going to look at the fruits of this gospel and see if, if, it, if it vets out. First, let's look at the judgment. In this gospel, is there, is there a, a need for a, a, a judgment? No, not really. I mean, ultimately, what, what you really need is a recording angel in heaven, right? An angel that will say, okay, um, Jane Doe, she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior back in, uh, on April the 22nd of 1982. And let's see, um, she never rejected Christ as her Savior. Check, you're in, you're saved, you're good. John Doe, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior in July the 21st of uh, 1985. And let's look down through here. Now, let's see. Now, he, has, um, he hasn't been a very good lad. Um, he's been rather promiscuous. He hasn't been faithful with his tithe. He definitely hasn't kept the Sabbath. Um, ooh, wow. He's even committed murder. But hmm, he never he never rejected Christ as his Savior, so boop, check. All good. You're saved. Do we need a judgment in this particular gospel? 
There's really no need for one because everybody's a sinner. We're all, we're all destined to be sinners all the way up to the very close of time until Jesus presses that magic button and makes us perfect. Interesting. Do we have clear instruction from the Word of God that there will be a judgment, though? Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. I'm beginning to wonder if maybe, maybe this isn't the best gospel. Let's look at another point, spirit of prophecy. Is there really any need for any new light? Everything that we need to know is in Scripture. There's really no need for any new light, right? It's kind of not important. We've got it all in the, in the Bible, if you, if you want, if you like. Well, what does the Bible say about this? Acts 2, 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days. When? Last in the last days. Saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and... And your old men shall dream dreams. So does that really bear out in Scripture? That we don't need to adhere to any, any new light? I don't think so. Alright, the next point. The Ten Commandments. The law of God. Is this really even relevant either? I mean, can, can anyone keep the Ten Commandments? The law of God? I mean, after all, if we're, if we're alive, if we're breathing, we're sinning, according to this gospel. Right? Seems rather irrelevant. But now the Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for, the sin is, for sin is the transgression of the law. So why is this even there? We would all be sinning. We'd all be transgressing the law of God constantly. Seems kind of silly to even have this text in the Bible, doesn't it? And why did Jesus say this? If you love me, keep my commandments. I'm constantly sinning. How can I, how can I keep the commandments of God? Let's look at the next point. Um... What about the Sabbath? <clears throat> Once again, that's in the heart of the law, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. Is that something that we can keep? Correct me if I'm wrong, but if your nature is, is, is causing you to sin constantly, then unless you checked your nature at the door before you came in here, you're sinning right now. You're breaking the fourth commandment right now, according to this gospel. Interesting. What do we see in Exodus 20, 8 through 11? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, which day is the Sabbath? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor the cat, nor the cattle, nor the, the uh, Stranger that is within thy gates, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now I want to ask you something. Do we have the ability to bless or to hallow a day? But yet according to this gospel, we... if. We don't need to keep any Sabbath day, but the Lord says that we need to remember the Sabbath day. And that he, he actually spe specified one specific day, and he even blessed it and hallowed it. And we can definitely keep track of it, because it's been kept track of all down through time. So we know which day that is. And praise God, we're here today on that day. Well, let's look at the next point. What about health reform? Well, this aspect of... The gospel here is definitely something that has to be um, in the sanctification category. And health reform, you know, it's, is it really something that is all that important? 
to keep take care of our bodies and our health? Is that really important? Well, according to Scripture here, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. Are we, doing, are we giving glory to God when we abuse our bodies? When we, when we drink these terrible soda drinks and, and um, when we eat uh, pork and different unclean things or even flesh meat today because all of it's pretty filthy, right? Are we, bringing, are we giving glory to God when we do these things? No. But according to this gospel, it doesn't matter. It may be a good idea, you know, good for you. You know, you, you've, you've done well, you're a vegan or you're a vegetarian or whatever, and you've done well and you've added a few more years to your life because statistically that's what we do as, as good vegetarians or vegans. Uh, statistically, uh, they live 7 to 10 years longer. So you've in improved your, your livelihood there a little bit further or your life a little bit further, but... That's good for you, but it's not really all that important for my salvation. It's not something that's salvational. Let's look at the next point, standards. Now, standards cover, cover a wide gamut of things, right? That includes what we watch on TV. That includes the activities that we partake of. Uh, that includes the uh, way that we dress whether we dress modestly or if we adorn ourselves with all different types of things. All of these things come into play when you're, when you're referring to standards. And once again, I think that uh, according to this gospel, it's a good idea, but it's not salvational. Believers in this, in this gospel say, Though I believe something to be correct from a religious perspective, it is not a matter of salvation. Hmm. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, again, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Are we giving glory to God when we go to rock concerts? When we even get all caught up and involved in sports, certain sports, all sports really, in a large part, are we really giving glory to God when we're um, wearing things that are inappropriate? You know, I think it's I think it's um, I think it's interesting analogy that when let's just say let's just put it this way let me put it this way let's say I love my wife Amy and I want to express my love to her and I come to her and from my ears. I have hanging pictures of other lovely women. And I have around my neck pictures of other lovely women. And I come to her with flowers and with candies or whatever the gift may be. And I say, look, honey, I love you. Look, I love you so much. And she's looking at me and she's going, what would you say to that, Amy? How would you feel about that? But you know, you know when um, when you when you look at jewelry in general, all jewelry is modeled after pagan gods. You have phallic symbols. You have the the circles. You have the triangles. You have the squares. You have the square diamonds. The the all the pair, all the different all the different designs. And so I just wonder, I just wonder how God looks at those things. I just wonder how God looks at those things when we are dressed so inappropriate, um, especially as I have seen, and I, I'm not picking on anyone here because I don't think anybody here is dressed inappropriate, by the way. Um, but 
I've been to some Seventh-day Adventist churches where the ladies up on the stage are dressed in a way with their skirts up to here and their pumps or five-inch stilettos or whatever you want to call them and their, and their blouses are down to here. And it looks to me like they would be perfectly welcome just to go right from the church right into the dance club or worse. Does it matter? Does God care about these things? According to this gospel, He doesn't. It's irrelevant. It's not salvation. Now you may be thinking that I don't um, think anyone really believes in this predestination anymore. You know, predestination is a term that has largely been um, voided from most Christians today and, and denominations. But it's interesting that even though, and, and, and too, this, this gospel was, was originated back in the 3rd and 4th centuries A.D., um, and everybody believed in this predestination gospel. But now today, they've gotten rid of the predestin, uh, predestination title to it, but they have kept the theology. And they are, they are actually building upon it, and it's still very much imbibed, embraced, and assimilated out into the masses of, of the Christian societies today. Isn't that interesting? They have got rid of the, the title of predestination, but the theology is all, the teaching is all still there. Now this, like I said before, this is the most popular gospel, or nature, if you will, out there right now today. It's the most popular. Isn't that a little bit alarming? But again, it's the most popular the right way. The whole world, you see, Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Not just a part of the world, the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, Revelation 13, 3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. This is, of course, a re reference to the papacy. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. So what's popular? Is that necessarily the right path to be on? I don't think so. Well, that's the first nature or the first gospel that we want to talk, out, talk about. And now we want to look at another gospel, the second gospel. This one is called the free choice gospel. Free choice, that sounds a whole lot better. Um, to me, uh, this means that we choose. We're not predestined. We're not chosen. And we're going to be saved whether we like it or not. We're going to be saved whether we sin all of our lives or not. This, this gospel teaches that we have a choice in the matter. And I present to you that free choice is one of the few things that we still have of the likeness of the Godhead. What do you think? To have free choice. Does God not have free choice? Were we not created in the likeness of God? This is a precious, precious uh, attribute that we have. Um, as I said before, we are not... God wants us to choose Him. Choose to serve Him. Choose to love Him. That's what He wants. He doesn't want heaven full of a bunch of robots without any free will. Once again, we start with sin, but this time, sin is a choice. So you may say, well, what happened? How did I get in this terrible state, uh, this terrible sinful state? And how do I get cleansed from this, this problem of sin in my life? Well, now we have a choice. It's not that we're born with just a bad nature. It's about decisions. It's about choices that we make in, 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 in throughout our lives. Joshua 24, 15. Does this bear out in Scripture? This, this teaching of the Gospel, does it bear out in, in Scripture to be truth? Joshua 24, 15. And if it seemeth e seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. 
You see, we have a choice. Whether the, the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Ammonite, Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. That's what I want to do. I want to serve the Lord. Amen. Well, this is an anonymous author, but I like what is said here. For several months now, I have, been I, I have been puzzling over what did I accept as truth that brought me to a sleepy attitude over victory in my life. Now it is clear that I had a misunderstanding to the nature of sin. Hmm. I have always accepted the fact that I needed the victory, but at the same time, I saw the task as impossible because I was regarding sin as a state of being. That's a pretty good realization to come to and to, and to, to get out of. You see, we can never overcome a state of being. However, if it is a choice, it is something that we can be overcomers about. Christ with fallen nature now, this is where it gets a little bit sticky. This is where a lot of people uh, get their feathers ruffled. That Christ was actually born with a fallen nature. Well, what does Scripture say about that? Is it possible? Hebrews 4.15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points, how many points? All points. Oh. Tempted like as we are yet without sin. If he, was, if he was born with an unfallen nature, then the temptations really wouldn't be that severe. Right. According to the other doctrine, um, it wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be a, an issue at all. But with this doctrine, with this gospel... It's very, very important. And I think that it's very, very important. Period. Let's look at here in Hebrews 2, 16 through 18. For, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels. Okay? He didn't take on the nature of, of Adam before the fall. He didn't take on the nature of angels. No. He took on him the seed of Abraham. Not just Adam after the fall, but the seed of Abraham. Many, many years later, much later, as, uh, as we have degenerated because of sin. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. What does succor mean? It means to, to relate to, to be like. To support in times of hardship and distress. So in order for Christ to really truly be our perfect sacrifice, He had to have been born in our nature. Otherwise, He has an unfair advantage over us. And people, people say, well, yeah, of course he had an unfair advantage. And, and that's not fair. Really? Okay. You know, all of heaven was emptied when he came to this earth, right? So we, who do we have if we fall and we make a mistake? Who do we have if we go to him and plead for forgiveness? Mediator. We have a mediator, right? Jesus Christ. We have a safety net. Yes. Amen? What about Jesus? Did he have a safety net? No, he didn't. If he had sinned, he would have been lost. Lost, lost. And so would all of we, yes. all of us. Another anonymous author says it this way, Jesus cannot be tempted in all points like as I am unless he was in all points like as I am to start with. He could not feel as I do unless he as is where I am. 
then in order to, be, to help me, Jesus must be where he can feel what I feel and be tempted in all points where I could be tempted with any power at all. Spot on. Yeah. Amen. The next point, justification and sanctification. You know, um, in the previous gospel, sanctification is a 50-50 process, right? According to the previous gospel. But in this gospel, justification and sanctification are all 100% from Jesus Christ. Amen? <clears throat> Let's say that <clears throat> you were at church, and um, I'll just pick on myself, for instance. You're at church, and you hear me uh, give a powerful testimony uh, of how great God is and how much He's working in my life. And then <clears throat> um, you're sitting there, and you're going, wow. Man, Brother Farr there, he's, he's, really, he's really got a great walk with the Lord. That's amazing. And so you decide to follow me home and, and spend a little time observing me, and you find out that um, I'm yelling at my wife a lot of the times. That I treat other people, children, other people, in a total disrespect and disregard. What would you say about my walk with the Lord at that time? I, by the way, I hope that you don't ever do this. And I hope you ever don't ever do, discover anything. I hope I don't ever do anything like that. And if I do, please, please uh, slap me over the head or something. Get my attention, please. I don't want to be in that condition. But what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of relationship do I really have with Christ? Phony. It's phony. I tell you something. That is my nature, though. Ultimately, that is my nature to be... Um, to, to be a, a, a sinful person, going to inappropriate things. There was a time when I did these things. It's only by a miracle of Jesus Christ and His saving power that I am who I am today. And I guarantee you, if I turn my back on the Lord tomorrow, I would revert back to that old way. Heaven forbid. Please, keep us all in prayer. Amen? Amen. We all have that, that propensity sin. <clears throat> John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, we can do 50-50? No. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. That's, that's Jesus speaking right there. All right. Perfection. What about with this gospel, is there a possibility of perfection. Now I got you. Yes. 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 Do we have any proof of that? If I ask any one of you if I could follow you home for, say, a month, and I take a camera, and I start filming you, all throughout particular events throughout that month. How many of you would volunteer for that? So we could prove that perfection is possible. I don't see any hands going up. No one would want to do that. Why? Because we know that we fall, don't we? We know that we fall. So what example do we have that is perfect? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, follow me on this point. We are to, He is the vine, we are the branches. If we abide in Him and He's abiding in us, are we going to do anything that's not perfect? No. The problem is, we like to sever ourselves from the vine. We need to learn how to stop doing that. Yes. So that we can be, become perfect. And we will have to, because just like I was talking about earlier, when that probation is ended... And Jesus stands up. He's not coming right that second. We're still going to be a period of time that we're going to have to exist and live. And we have to remain perfect. Amen. We have to remain sealed. Remain in that sealed condition. Amen. So we will have to be perfect one day. It's going to have to, to come to fruition. 
So this is quite a different gospel, right? Yes. And it's very, very important that we choose the right gospel in which we believe in. Because if we believe in once saved, always saved, and that goes for Seventh-day Adventists as well as anyone else, because the Seventh-day Adventists, as we discovered last Sabbath, they have a once saved, always saved belief that is tailor-made just for Seventh-day Adventists. So we need to be careful what we truly believe in. And unfortunately, um, I may show you some, some of these things, but unfortunately, um, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have joined and united with the first gospel. God forbid. We're very sad. So yes, we can be perfect because Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But without Him, we can do nothing perfect. Amen? Amen. I would like to just really quickly describe these two Gospels in one word. The first Gospel I would describe as forgiveness. Forgiveness. There's nothing wrong with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a good thing. But this Gospel I would describe as restoration. That's a much better word than just forgiveness. Because we can get, get forgiveness, but then continue to sin, right? But restoration. We want to be fully restored, amen? amen? Restored in the likeness of our Lord and Savior. Okay, with this gospel, do we have a need of a judgment? No. Absolutely we do. There is a need for the judgment. You know, we are told that we will judge angels even. And you know, this isn't a process where we need to check up on God and He may have made some mistakes, so we need to correct Him, this kind of thing. No. This is going to be us looking at it and saying, you know, why isn't my brother or sister here, or my mom or dad or this person or that person, my pastor, what have you? And then we can go through the books and we can see exactly why. And you know what? At the end of that thousand years, the books... Well, we will proclaim that Jesus was absolutely right and spot on in every case. Amen? But yes, there will be and there is um, the need for the judgment. In 1844, as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that this investigative judgment began when? October 22nd, 1844, right? That's when Jesus went from the holy to the most holy and began the investigative judgment. And where else do we see the importance of this and the uh, message here? We see it in, in Revelation 14, 7 again. Um, does this fall in line with Scripture now? Does this gospel fall in line with Scripture? That there is going to be a judgment? Or that the judgment is going on right now, actually? Absolutely it does. Spirit of Prophecy. Does this gospel support the need of spirit of the spirit of God of, of, of prophecy? Absolutely, it does. This scripture here from Acts it all lines up with scriptures. It bears out in the scripture that uh, that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, see visions, dream dreams. Do we have a prophet? We do, don't we? And I like to include this one here, Second Chronicles. Uh, 20 and verse 20. I didn't put the verse up there, but that's what it is. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of uh, Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. If we discard our prophets, we are in trouble. We are in deep, deep trouble. All right, what about the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments, they can now be something that we could keep, right? And it is, they are relevant. And it's, it's not just nonsensical that this uh, text is in the, the Word of God, because if we transgress the law of God, then we're, we're committing sin. 
Um, and if we love Jesus, we're going to keep His commandments. It's a natural thing. When we love the Lord, it's just like, I love my wife, so therefore I want to do what she wants me to do. I'm not going to go out on her and do things that I shouldn't be doing. Why? Because I love her. It's automatic. And the Sabbath, of course, it's very, very important. And it's interesting, too, that the Sabbath is the one commandment that is visible to the rest of the world. If we are honest with ourselves, and if we um, are honest with those that we come in contact with, they're going to find out that we're Seventh-day Adventists. And shame on us if they don't. They're going to find out that we keep the Saturday Sabbath, not Sunday Sabbath. And people should know that. We just, I just heard a testimony this morning from one of you, I can't remember, that worked, oh, Patricia, yeah, talking about the dentist that was a Seventh-day Adventist. And... No, not the dentist, I worked for a physician. Oh, a physician, okay, I'm sorry, physician. Then, and I'm never, the, the person working for him never knew that they were Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, Philip, do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just telling you, my sister, she worked for the Seventh-day Adventist dentist. Okay. And, and did she know? Or, or, no. No, never said she anything? never shared She'd like to get the Sabbath on Saturday <laughs> Right. We should be sharing these very important truths. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It makes sense that this scripture now is in the Holy Word of God, right? It's, it's lining up a whole lot. You see how it's lining up? Much, much straight, much more straight and pure than the previous gospel. Now, what about health reform? Is this really a salvational issue? Is it possible that the health reform could be a salvational issue? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, good. Now, if I were to take in, uh, or you, you were to take in, let's say, uh, you know someone who is very sickly and struggling uh, with their health, and uh, you tell them, okay, you can, you can come and I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you to regain your health, okay? And you teach them not the eight laws of health, but seven laws of health. You teach them, you, you, you set down the rules too. You make sure that they know they have to get up when you say get up. They've got to eat what you say to eat. They've got to follow the strict, very strict program, okay? And at the end of the let's say, year that you had them uh, at your place, at the end of that year, their health is restored. They are doing 100% better than they were when they first came to your home. Now, let's say that they, they left and they went back into the world and they continued to stay on this regime and follow the health principles that you gave him or her. You know, statistically, as I said before, we live seven to ten years longer. So this person achieves that. They live seven to ten years longer. But then, when Jesus comes, at the end, they find out that they're being resurrected in the wrong resurrection. They're in the second instead of the first. Did the health reform save their life? They were able to live a few more years on this earth. But we forgot one of the essential, very essential aspects of the laws of health. And that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we can't just be saved by our diets, as so many that I even know seem to believe anyway. We must have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ in addition to that. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whatever you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. This fits, this makes sense. This is, this is a, a very relevant scripture to us. 
Well, let's talk about the standards. You know, Satan is a very, very good communicator, is he not? He communicates very well with us. You know, when he was first allowed on this earth, was he able to chase Adam and Eve all over the garden and tempt them? No, there was only one place in the garden that he had access to them. And man, if, if they only knew how serious that was, I, I would say that they should have gone to work immediately, the very first thing they did, and ac actually just build, built the biggest, strongest, most, the highest towering wall and circulating that tree and blocking out that temptation forever. Don't you wish you could go back and just tell them that? Hey, don't worry about anything else in the garden. The first thing you need to do is to build a massive wall, no windows or doors, around this tree and totally block it out from all obscure, so that Satan has no access to you whatsoever. But they didn't. Unfortunately, as we know, they didn't. But... But can we have, in some way, can we do that today? Can we block out Satan's temptations? Yes, Philip. Can I say it? We do have a wall. It's called the Ten Commandments. That's true. The Ten Commandments, is that is absolutely true. But yes, can we not block out Satan's temptations? How can we do that? Jesus. Yes. In, in Jesus, the law, all these things are good. But how can we do that? Are we blocking out Satan's temptations when we watch inappropriate programming? Yep. When we listen to inappropriate music? We're inviting. When we eat inappropriate food? All of these things. You see, the body and the mind are connected. Mm -hmm. So when we're polluting the body, it clouds the mind. Yeah. And whatever aspect of, of the standards that we're talking about, that we're referring to... Um, so every way that we can block out the temptations of Satan and, and, and build that wall in keeping the commandments of God, not in our power, but in Jesus' strength we can do that. In all things, He can help us in all things. Again, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is a re very relevant scripture, and there's many, many, many other scriptures I can put up that apply in, in every different way and, and many different aspects of what we're referring to here. To me, when I look at the whole of scripture, this is the gospel that lines up and bears out within scripture. The other one does not. Are there texts that you can pull out here and there that may seem to support it? I would agree. But if you look at scripture from from uh, start to finish, this is the only gospel that truly bears out. This is another anonymous author, and I really like what is said here. It is sad to see the illusion popularized that lifestyle issues such as diet and adornment come from a religious perspective, but are not a matter of salvation. If the written counsel of God addresses a subject it must be salvation related or God would have left it alone. Isn't that so true? I really like that statement. I think it's very, very true. Can we have victory? Absolutely we can have victory. We can have victory in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is the only way that we can have the victory but this gospel proclaims that we can have victory. This gospel proclaims that sin is a choice and we do not have to take that choice. We don't have to make that choice to sin. We can live a perfect life in Christ and in Christ only. I pray that we do that each and every one, each and every day.